I want us to go ahead and take your Bible, turn to uh, Ephesians and 1 Peter. Turn to 1 Peter 3 and Ephesians 5, and um, we'll just kind of take it in that direction. I'm going to start with Ephesians first, but we're going to be in, we're doing a study of the book of 1 Peter, and uh, when you get there, we'll just go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Appreciate everybody coming in tonight. It's probably been a long day for you, and and maybe you're a little bit tired, and so you just sit back and relax. God's got it all. Amen? Ephesians 5, 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, in 1 Peter 3, you're dealing with a message that you won't hear taught, preached in too many churches. I'm not saying all of them, but you just don't, if it's taught in some churches, it won't be taught biblically, won't be taught right. And uh, we're living in a day right now where rules of authority, people don't want to hear it. They don't, it doesn't matter what, what area you fit in, people just don't want to hear it. They're, we have a very rebellious generation. And... Um, I mean, that's just how it is, and that rebellion has spilled over into our churches. And, um, but in praying about this and in seeking the Lord's direction in it, uh, I felt at liberty to kind of take it in this direction. We're going to take everything that we learn about being a submissive wife, and we're going to apply it to this church. This church is to be a submissive wife to our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. We don't tell Jesus what we want him to do. He tells us. And he moves us. And he, he uses us. So just kind of keep that in mind. And, and just think about what God's trying to teach us tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And um, let's, just, uh, let's just tell God about our problems for the day. And tell God what it is you need. And let's just ask God to fill us tonight. Amen. Father in heaven, I look over this crowd tonight, Lord, I know that there are some, uh, some people, Lord, that could really use your help tonight. And Father, where else can we go? We've, we try everything in the world, and we try to do things on our own, and nothing, nothing works, Father. So we come to you, and we thank you, God, for being our last resort in that when we come to you we have no need then of going anywhere else you're our father you're our Lord you're our God you're our creator and out of all the people in the world who love us you love us more than all of the people in this world put together father we thank you for that love we thank you Lord for your forbearance and your long suffering with us we thank you, God, for uh, placing, Lord, into our stewardship the Word of God and the ministry that you have given us as a church and as individuals for that Word. And Father, I pray, God, that you would bless that Word tonight. Bless all of those that are gathered here tonight and bless it in their hearing. And Father, may we receive joy and blessing and satisfaction from heaven itself tonight. Father, I pray for these that are watching online and visiting with us. And Father, we thank you for them. And Lord, we ask God that you would just touch them with a double blessing tonight. In that, Lord, they cannot find a church where they're still teaching the old way and the old book. Father, they've joined with us tonight. And I just pray, God, that you would just give them a rich blessing from your word. Father, I thank you for this book and what it says. And, and Lord, all the things that you help us with in our life. And Father, I just pray, dear God, that you would just open up your word to us tonight. Jesus, would you come and be the preacher tonight and open up this book and unseal it in our ears, in our minds, in our hearts. And we'll thank you for this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Ephesians 5. Let's start there. All right, Ephesians 5. Um, I could probably, in fact, you know what, let's, let me do that. I just want to give the context of, of uh, Ephesians 5 because Paul addresses this issue of, of a godly wife, but he's not just dealing with the wife here. 
He deals with anybody that's under any kind of authority. And um, if you go back to, um, oh, let's see here, uh, verse 21, where he said, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. In that verse right there, he has placed every one of us as equals to one another. As far as the brotherhood and as far as being brethren in Christ. God is our father. We are his sons and his daughters. So which one of us is the better son or daughter than the other one? Not one. If we're going to compare ourselves. Let's compare ourselves to the first begotten son. And that's Jesus Christ. And when we compare ourselves to him, we don't, we don't add up. No way. So in the sense that we are sons and daughters of God. And he's made us all equal in that respect. We submit ourselves one to another. We become servants to one another. When we have feet washing service here, who is it designated that washes the pastor's feet? Anybody who wants to. Who am I supposed to wash? Anybody I want to. Well, anybody I should. Anybody. The Pope. I don't know if you know this. He has a feet washing service every Easter. And he has his high ranking cardinals that he washes their feet. But as far as the common man, he don't touch them. Because they've got him elevated as the, what do they call him? Holy Father. That's God's name. There's a curse on that. Amen. I wouldn't want to not be standing around him in a lightning storm. Amen. Okay. But in that sense, we are submitted to one another. So then he moves on and says, uh, then, he, then he says, verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, unto your own husband. As a wife, you're not submissible to anybody else's husband. Amen? You're, you're submissive to your own husband. Uh, verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So as we deal with this, we're going we're gonna to learn the value of having a submissive church. And if we will have a submissive church unto the Lord, then all of these things, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto us. So if we will concentrate as a church on being a submissive church to the Lord, God will add his blessings to our marriages and our homes and everything else, okay? So verse um, 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, see that word as means equal, as. As the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands. Here's the greater responsibility, guys. Greater responsibility. Husband loves your wives. And I'm not saying you guys, you ladies, are hard to love most of the time. <laughs> okay? It's just, oh, I want to hear that joke. There's got to be a good one going on between you. Okay? Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. You see what he says here? We're to give unconditionally how did you get salvation Ryan how'd you get salvation freely what kind of slop were you in when God saved you the worst of it so it's unconditional okay husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church gave himself for it. that's how you define love giving that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. If a church will have Christ as the word of God as its head, God will sanctify that church by that same word. And then he will then sanctify our homes, our marriages. He'll sanctify our relationships. He'll bless them, but he'll do it by the water of the word of God. Okay? That, that priest... As he goes into the tabernacle, he cannot enter in except he go by what they call the brass, the brazen laver. It's where we get the word lavatory from. And it's basically a big brass pan full of water. And before that priest could go into that sanctuary, he had to wash. He had to be clean. Okay? So he might sanctify it and cleanse it. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle. Do a study of the word spot, okay? Uh, leopards cannot change their spots. 
false teachers are spots on your feast of charity the Bible says uh, and the beast is likened to a leopard okay that means he's spotted he's he's the man of sin or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish so ought men um, to love their so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies he that loveth his wife loveth himself for no man ever yet hated his own flesh but nourisheth it and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church that word as again that is an equal sign as Christ has done this for our church so husbands do this for your wife uh, verse 30 for we are members of his body of his flesh and of his bones for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh this is a great mystery but I speak concerning Christ and the church now let's go to first Peter chapter 3 over to first Peter chapter 3 verse 1 likewise ye wives and so I've got that underline I got it up on the screen underline underline it in your Bible and when you see that and next time you read this you'll remember this pertains to a church as well. We've already seen the equal signs in Ephesians chapter 5. We've already been taught that as the husband loves the wife, as Christ loved his church and gave himself for it, I mean, he sacrificed his own life, shed his own blood, took the scourging that you, it should have been laid to you and I, took the mocking and the shame and the beating that was our reproach stripped naked in front of all to see. Now, I know we don't have paintings of Jesus being naked on that cross. He's always got some kind of little covering, but the Bible says they stripped him down. That signifies, see, the Bible teaches us it is a shame to be naked. And that signifies that Christ bore our shame and our reproach on him on the cross. You know what that means? Husbands, don't go around trying to blame your wife for everything. Especially publicly. I knew a guy. He's in prison right now. That's where he needs to be. Methamphetamine prison. Bad. We went to high school. Me and my sister went to high school with him. He was mean as a rattlesnake. Got a young gal pregnant there in high school and married her. And okay, they got married. Boy, everything's supposed to be fine now. He was, the, he was one of the worst human beings I think I've ever personally known in my life. He would get around his buddies. And he would say, hey, guys, watch this. And then he would go and just literally tear down and destroy his wife right in front of everybody. Tears rolling down her eyes while him and he's laughing at his buddy. His buddy's laughing at him, trying to get, you know, points with him, trying to, I guess, get in with him or something like that. That was the kind of skunk that he was. Don't do that to your wife. Okay? Christ took the reproach that is is on us because of our sins okay who in here wants everybody to know the very worst things you've ever done no, nobody Christ took the reproach and the shame and the mocking and everything else and he refused to lay blame to his wife remember what he said on the cross father forgive them for they know not what they do Remember the last words of Stephen? As there, what is it, John? Father, forgive me. You go look at Stephen. When Stephen died being the first martyr of the church, he died ex almost identical to the way Christ did. He is forgiving those who are killing him while they're throwing stones at him. That's got to be the Holy Spirit. That's not his nature. That is the Holy Spirit at work in, in his life. So if you find any of these things difficult, either the husband or the wife, if you find any of these things difficult, remember, it is Christ and the Holy Spirit working through you and not, don't try to apply your own nature to it. Okay, it won't work. It must be the Holy Spirit. It must be Christ. And it must be His Word coming out of you. All right? So, uh, likewise, you wives, be in sub subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word 
they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. It is the only place in the Bible where it says a man can be saved without the Bible. Okay? Now I'll give you, I'll give you a true story. Uh, as I grow up in our home, God first dealt with my mama. And in 1970. 1974 this church used to be over where a highway is right now okay and they had to they had to sell that land they sold it over to the state because they were plowing through there and putting highway a in that was the original place and I remember going there maybe once or twice but then I remember coming here and it was the lady across the street that was inviting my mom and us to this church and we landed here and stuck here ever since and all through my childhood, mama got up, dressed me and my sister. We went to Sunday school. We went to Sunday morning church. We went home, laid around, took a nap, did whatever, come back Sunday night, six o'clock, we were here. We were here in the house of God. Wednesday night, we were here. Revival meeting all week, we were here. Quarterly meeting, we were here in the house of God. Dad never came. And we tried. I mean, I tried to talk to him and mom tried to talk to him or whatever and there was, there was times when my mom was soft about it. There was time when my mom had to put her foot down on some things and say, we're not going to do that in this house, okay? Over time, God began to use my mother, not me, not the preacher. In fact, when I was a teenager, I was probably more of a stumbling block to my dad getting in church because he saw how I behaved outside of church and he knew I was going to church. And there's a long story, I won't get into it. But I think I was a stumbling block to him getting in, getting in church when I was a teenager. And it took me leaving before God began to work through my mom. All those years, my mom would pray. All those years, she would just weep for my dad. And then one day, he just decided to start going to church with her down here at DeSoto. Amen. And he went faithfully every Sunday until the day he died. Amen. God's grace to me was giving me that last prayer with my daddy five minutes before he closed his eyes. I'll never forget it as long as I live. But how that happened was through my mother. Amen. Okay? Now, you apply that. We know that Christ has done all the work so it's possible for a person to go to heaven when they die. It was his blood that was shed. It was his atonement. It was his perfect spotless life that he lived on this earth being careful not to violate and break the law of God and thus put a stain of sin on his own self. He lived a spotless life, shed his own blood, became the substitutionary atonement for all the sins of mankind, died rose from the dead, ascended up to the Father. As the high priest now, he is offering the blood of sprinkling, his own blood, buying the ransom for the church of God. Amen? Christ, as far as that's concerned, Christ did all of that. But let's take this then and apply it. Likewise, you wives, think about what we're talking about here. We're talking about church. If anybody says... Oh, I'm just as good a Christian as you church people are. You ever hear them say that? Oh, I can be just as, I, I can be just as close to God out with a fishing rod in my hand or a gun in my hand or what. I mean, I've heard it all. That's an excuse to not get up and go to the house of God is what it is. Because they have, in their mind, they've worked out their own little special agreement with God. God, I'll drink my beer and I'll smoke my cigarettes and I'll smoke a little marijuana every now and then and God I'll look at other women and I'll go party every Friday night but every night but God I, you're, I'm still want to go to heaven now God me and you have got our own thing going don't we and God's sitting up in heaven going no mm -mm. there's one way God left the ministry of the saving of men's souls into the hands of the church Amen. I'm a church member 
and a believer in the assembling together of God's people, and I think you ought not forsake that assembling together. I mean, you think about it now. Likewise, you wives be in subjection to your husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, let's take that and apply it in, in this deal with the church, okay? In the, in the world we're living in right now, what do most people think about most churches? Hypocrites, what else? Worldly? It's a joke? Huh? Simple-minded. They ain't got a brain in their head. They ain't got a brain in their toothless head, do they, George? Okay? Bunch of rednecks that don't know better. Can't add two plus two. That's why they believe in that God stuff. Okay? Everybody knows we came from monkeys, right? Okay? To most people. In fact, let's get down to it. Before you got saved, what was your impression of most churches? Fake? Greedy? Wanting everybody's money. Okay? What's, what's coming out now as far as in the news and churches and stuff like that? You got preachers going to jail for fraud, embezzlement, rape, child molestation. I mean, you've got it all. You've got churches acting in many cases worse than the worldly people do. Now you think about this and look at your Bible. That they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wise. Before, before a lost man in today's world is to ever hear the word of God, he's got to be convinced in his mind that the church that's inviting him is worth going to. Amen. Yeah. It's got to be worth going to. In other words, that church as a group, the, the gathering together of those people had better act the way Christ calls us to act. And be, see that word conversation? That's what that means. What do people say about you? As a Christian, what are your lost family members and your lost friends and people you work with and everybody that knows you? What do they say about, I'm not talking about what the church people say about you, I'm talking about what everybody else says about you. What is your conversation with mankind outside of this building? And that goes to you people online too, okay? What do people know about you? What do they say about you behind your back? Are they tuck and now I know that there's people out there that are not gonna they're they're never gonna like Christians, they're never gonna like church, they're not gonna have anything to do with it, and that's just and they're always gonna mock. But there is absolutely nothing wrong with you developing for yourself a witness and a testimony and a conversation that when people talk about you, they say, you know, I don't believe much in that Bible, but I'll tell you that guy right there, he lives it. Amen. He lives it. I mean, I may not, I'm not much of a church man, but if I ever was, I'd go to that guy's church there. Amen. Okay? And before God allowed me to be a pastor of a church, God made me rub shoulders in the workforce with lost people. And my brother-in-law was one of them. And my brother-in-law knew after, it, it, took, it took a while, but he knew that if he was ever to go to meet God, he was going to do it by way of me. Amen. Okay? And I'm not saying, I cannot say that I did everything perfect around my brother-in-law. I can't do that. But what I let him see was not that I was perfect, but that I had grace. I had forgiveness. I had mercy on me. And it was the same mercy that he, that he wanted in his life a week before he went to go to heaven. Okay? And I'm just telling you, that kind of stuff makes a difference in people's lives. Okay? We can go hand out DVDs to people, and I, I appreciate what everybody's doing. Man, it just thrills my heart. Okay? 
We can send emails out to people and, and try to get them to watch one of our church services, one of our videos or whatever. I mean, I'm glad we've got what we've got because nowadays people just don't know that they can trust every church they go to, so why bother? But at least we're giving them a chance to get a sneak peek before they try it out. Amen? I mean, I'm in favor of that. But what I'm saying is, when they come in here and they see us here, we'd better be the exact same people outside of here as what they see in here. And, and this is very important to me, and God's helped me with this over the years. When I started putting these videos out on the internet, I told God, I said, God, I do not want to be anything other than what I already am. I don't want to put on some kind of big show on the camera. And then everybody comes and finds out that I'm, no, I'm nowhere near that. Who in here remembers the night that we talked about live streaming our church service? Remember what we said? No, I do. <laughs> it's okay if you don't. I do. What I said was, what I don't want to do is turn something on here that's different when the cameras are on than when the cameras are off. If we're going to do this, we're going to be us. We're going to be who we are. We're not going to try to put on a show for everybody and make it look like we're really something. And then when the camera goes off, everybody goes, wow, they must be really something. And then they come here and find out we ain't all that. Amen? And what I hear from people when they come visit, they say, man, we feel like we already know you guys so much. And they come and visit and they say, yeah, that's what we saw on camera. That's what we saw. I want us to be real, people. I don't want us to be perfect. That belongs to one man. Okay? What I want us to be, and I've always wanted us to be, is genuine in that if we goof, we goof. Amen, Alicia? If we use our elbows to play the piano, it sounds just the same if we used our fingertips. Okay? We make mistakes. We goof. Things don't always go right. Sometimes I feel really great. Sometimes I don't. And if I don't feel so good... I don't try to put on some big show like, oh, I feel great, amen. Oh, gosh, get me out of here. Okay? That kind of stuff matters to people. And in today's world, it means everything to them. So let's go read this again now. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Now, let's just stop right here and let's dwell on this for a little bit, okay? Number one, what we present here in this church above anything else is what? What are we known for? What does everybody on the internet know us for? The Bible. So look at it. Likewise, you wives be in subjection to who? Your own husbands. Who's our husband here? Our husband is the Word of God. Okay? That's who we're married to. Literally, by name, his name is the Word of God. That's who we are in subjection to. So that we've got a whole world full of people out here that obey not the Word. Don't they? They don't obey it. They don't know the Bible. They don't, they don't want the Bible. They, don't, they think we're crazy for believing it. But if one thing they're going to know about us is that we are submissive to the Word of God. What the Word of God says, that's what we believe. It's settled. Whether we understand it or not is irrelevant. It's what it says. That's what matters. I'm not going to be judged by what I understand about the Word of God. I'm going to be judged by what I believe about the Word of God. Amen. And being in subjection to it, being submissive to it. So, people out there, they don't know the Bible. When they come to a church, I don't care if they think, boy, those are some of the best musicians I've ever heard in my life. I am stunned at what I hear. I don't care if they think that or not. I mean, I try my best. And we all try our best to sing, amen? That's not what we want to be known for. 
okay? Whether I'm the best preacher in Jefferson County or the state of Missouri, I don't care. What they don't need is more music and more fluff from a preacher. What they need is the Word of God. Whether they realize it or not, that's what they need. So, likewise, you wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the Word, they may also, without the Word, be won by the conversation of the wives. Watch this. While they behold your chaste conversation. Chaste. What does that word mean? Simple? Simple? Just looked it up. Did you really? Yeah. Look it up again. I think it means pure. Help us out with that, all right? Chaste is chastity. It means pure, virgin. Okay? That means the preacher doesn't wear Budweiser t-shirts. Anywhere. Anywhere. Even from his bedroom to the bathroom, the preacher doesn't wear Budweiser t-shirts. And also, the preacher doesn't have bottles of Budweiser light in his refrigerator. Or anything else that shouldn't be in his house. Or anybody else in the church shouldn't have that stuff. So that's our chaste comfort. Not that we're better than everybody. Because see, I've been in church a long time. And I've known a lot of women who follow all the rules as far as what a godly woman is to look like. And they're so full of pride, I don't want anywhere near them. I want nothing to do with that. That's legalism as far as I'm concerned. Ladies and gentlemen, put that stuff on to try to make a show to everybody. And I'll tell you what, it doesn't impress a lost man. But if he sees that church humble before God, knowing that that, that holiness that they have in them does not come from, uh, from the outside, it comes from within. It comes from what God has purified them and made them whole and clean, all right? Well, they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Should we have fear? Seventh, seventh uh, spirit of God is the fear of the Lord, okay? That means that we have an honest respect for what God could have done to us. We know what we deserve, and that is hell. And we're not getting what we deserve. And we're not all shouting cocky, arrogant about it. We're humble by that. Because we still fear the Lord. Okay? A uh, couple of fear who's adorning. Let it not be the outward adorning, the plating of hair. Now let me ask you, is there anything wrong with ladies fixing your hair? What would you call that you and Melissa got going back here. A bun? Looks like plating to me. I don't know what it is in any way. Is there anything wrong with fixing your hair a certain way? Courtney, is there anything wrong with it? No? Other than trying to look like a butch lesbian. Whose outward adorning, let it not be the plating of the hair. Wearing, is there anything wrong with wearing gold? No? Anything wrong? Obviously, is there anything wrong with putting on apparel? No! Uh, do a study of Ezekiel 16. God adorned Jerusalem with costly array. Put an earring in her ear. Put a necklace around her. Dolled her up pretty. But what does she do with it? What did Jerusalem do with it? She went and found some other lovers. She took what God gave her and how God adorned her and glorified her and she went out playing the harlot to everybody. And I want to tell you something. There's a bunch of harlot churches all over this world, all over this country that are using the things that God has blessed them with to draw attention to them. Or the man, the pastor of that church, using his talents that God has given him to draw attention to himself. Okay? That's why there is no such thing as Mike Hoggard Ministries. 
And that's not what I'm interested in. What I want people to see is this coming out of this church, okay? So, nothing wrong with having a nice building to meet in. There's certainly nothing wrong with, with us trying to present ourselves in a positive way to people. But we make this mistake of getting people to look at us or our church or how great it is and look at what we have done or look at what I am. That is a huge mistake. That spells harlot is what that does. That is the signs of a church that is whoring herself out to everybody that comes along. Okay? Um, but let it be the hidden man. The ladies, isn't that interesting? That Peter said that what people should be attracted to is the man in you, not the woman. Remember what the woman is? It's your soul. Who's the man? It's Jesus. Okay? It's Jesus Christ. That's who they're supposed to be drawn to. That's what, and we all know this, beauty wears off over time. And if all a ladies, you've seen some of these Hollywood gals that are 80 years old trying to look like they're still 18. I don't care how many surgeons cut on her and how much money she spends, it doesn't work. If all she's got going for herself is what's on the outside, there ain't nothing there. Let it be the hidden man in this church. What's on the end, not what's on the outside, what's on the inside, not only of this building, but in every one of us, what's on the inside of here, that's what matters, okay? Let it be the hidden man of the heart of that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great Price. Remember what Solomon said about a virtuous woman. What did it say about price? Her price is far above rubies. Okay? And that's because of who lives inside of us. Now, just very quickly, I want to I want to show you this, okay? And if you've already seen this, then go to sleep. But this is one of my favorite things. When I talk about Christ and the church. To me, it's as plain as this. He's the head, and we're the body. Okay? Does it matter what part of the body you are? No. Because if this little pinky is going to heaven, it's dragging this foot with it. Okay? It doesn't matter where you sit on the bus. The bus is going to the same place. Amen? Okay? But keep in mind... That God designed the body, he designed it right. He did not put the head of the body down here on the knees. He did not put the head under the feet. Okay? He did not put the head in other places. Okay? He put the head right here on top where it belongs. And that shows authority. That shows dominion. Okay? And the brain is the head. That's Christ. Christ is the brains of this outfit. That means his word is where our thinking comes from. It's where our plans come from. What we decide to do as a church, it comes from the word of God. How, how we reach people, I think, is as important as what we're reaching them with. Because if how we're reaching them does not match what we're reaching them with, something's not right. So we should not come in here playing our ACDC to get everybody, oh, I love that song. I think I'll go to this church. And then try to give them the gospel. Try, try to preach a sermon on hell. Which is what, what's his name? Perry something there. Perry Noble out in South Carolina. He's a cursing preacher. His sermons, he, he got thrown out because he's a drunkard too. But he labeled his sermons as PG-13. Anybody in sixth grade and below could not come to the adult worship service. Because the way he was going to talk. And Jared, I kid you not, he used his band to play Highway to Hell and Hell Ain't No Bad Place to Be as an introduction to him preaching on hell. It doesn't work. Amen. You say, there's something wrong with that guy. Yeah, he was a drunk. He was a whiskey-sipping, alcoholic, 
trying to convince everybody that he was right before God and all of us conservatives were nuts. Okay? The head does the thinking here. Okay? We are the body, which means that we receive our instructions from the Word of God and the Word of God alone. Just as in the body, you've got how many, how many bones in your backbone? 33, which means out of each side, you've got a nerve bundle that comes from the head down the spinal column out to the body and the head then sends its messages out through these 66 passageways to the entire body that's your bible this is how it's to be done here this is how we think this is how we live this is who we are as a church we are never, we do not tell Jesus how it's going to be. And we certainly don't tell the brain that it's wrong. Meaning we never look at our Bible and say, I think that's an error. I think that's a mistake. I think maybe, maybe it was relevant back then, but in our time it really should be this way. Well, I don't have a problem with women being pastors. A church that believes that has got the head somewhere else other than where it's supposed to be. Amen. More than likely, under their feet. Amen. And they trample on and take dominion over the Word of God when it should be the Word of God in dominion over us. Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of wife, even as Christ is the head of of the church and he's the savior of the body God is going to keep his only begotten son with him in heaven for all of eternity if you are hooked in to the body you're going where the head goes remember what he said that where I am there ye may be also and so to me I mean I know this simple stuff you probably heard me talk about it before but let's let's just set this as a course and in our mind as we go through this issue about women being submissive to her husbands and I know there's women out there you've been abused you've been tattered you've been torn you've been mistreated you've been everything in the world but I'm telling you I may not have all the answers to that but I know God does I know God does and rather than women accepting a role that is not rightfully theirs or assuming a role that is not rightfully theirs Let's be like our church is supposed to be. If the head says this is what we're doing, then this is what we're doing. If the head says we're not going here, then we're not going here. If the head tells us we're going to stay away from that, that's not good, that's not good for us. It, it, it may not be a sin, but it just doesn't look right. Then the head says that and that's what the body does. Amen? As we go through this, keep this men and women and children keep that in your mind okay I want this church and from what I can see I think yeah we've got room to improve but I love what God has done in this place I could not expect any more out of a body of people than what God has done in this place and I am very very happy to be a part of it here all I am is a big mouth Okay?